Okay, Bismillah, um, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, wa ala rasulina, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa na murizuqa na tiba'ah, wa arina al-baatila baatila urizuqa na jtina'ah. Oh Allah, we ask you to let us see truth as truth and follow it, and let us see falsehood as falsehood and keep it away from us. Allahumma arina al-ashya'a kamahi. Oh Allah, let us see things as they truly are, not just how they appear to our senses. Um, so this is a, a presentation that I've been thinking about for about two and a half years, and it deals with, um, you know, I, I've always been fascinated as, you know, the major 10 signs of the hour, like how are these things all connected? Um, so I did a very long presentation for the Muslim Student Association at, uh, in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, on the, it's on the internet for anyone who wants to watch it. But uh, one particular subject that I find fascinating is uh, Dabatul Ard. And um, I really don't feel like any explanation I've heard of this really made a lot of sense to me. Um, of course, I'm a student of Sheikh Imran Hussein, and uh, I highly recommend anyone before they watch this talk today, they go and watch his recent lecture about four months ago, I believe in Birmingham, he did uh, on, on this particular subject. Um, so I don't know that I'm going to answer the question as to what is Dabat al today. I'm going to, you know, frankly state what I think it is, but I'm going to also try to discuss like what its impact on us is, um, because I'm going to actually present something I don't think I've seen any of his students or Sheikh Imran Hussein mentioned before. Uh, so without further ado, um, let me quickly share my screen. You've got me disabled to share screen, so sorry, screen. Okay, so uh, this presentation uh, I titled um, uh, The Antichrist, the Beast, and uh, The Antichrist, the Beast, Time and Gratitude. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, can you see my screen, by the way? Yes, yes. Okay, so those of you who aren't familiar with the teachings of Sheikh Imran Hussein, I'm not going to try and just rehash those ideas for you, um, which is that he's trying to use the Quran to explain the, the signs of the hour. And of course, he's uh, very well known for having uh, interpreted this particular passage from the Quran that describes what he believes to be Dajjal. And of course, I, I would say I absolutely 100% agree with him uh, for multiple reasons that he doesn't mention. But he connects the concept of the Jal to the concept of the Messiah, which is connected to the concept of the kingdom of Israel, um, and in particular, the kings of David and Solomon, peace be upon them both. So I'm going to be talking a lot about Solomon today, actually, alayhi salam. Um, but for those of you who don't know, he interprets this particular passage about uh, a jesed like a lifeless body being on the throne of Solomon. And of course, this is metaphorical language, um, which is, you know, unfortunately today, too many Muslims uh, want to take everything so literal and not penetrate beyond the surface. Um, the, the Kursi is not literal, the Jesid, uh, you know, all of these things represent something. The Kursi represents the, the, the throne uh, of, of, of a king, which is his, power over his kingdom, you know what I mean? And someone wants to take that from him. Uh, so anyway, beyond that, if those of you are familiar with it, you're with his students, you already know what this is all about. So I'm going to try and connect the Iblis, uh, the Antichrist, the beast of the earth, the sun rising from the west, and the uh, sinkings of the earth all in one fell swoop, uh, and Gog and Magog. So, firstly, I, I definitely am on the same page with Sheikh Imran when he mentions that, you know, like, we should really be focusing a lot of our energy on the Dajjal, because the Prophet Sallallahu said that there is no fitna greater than the fitna he brings. And I also am 100% on board with him and his interpretation in uh, Jerusalem and the Quran that the Dajjal is not simply just a person who appears at a particular time in history, but there's a fitna of the Dajjal that leads up to him, which you've mentioned in the past. And I'm also uh, very much on board with the idea that the Antichrist is something that can be contacted before it appears as an actual person. 
So most of the time when we talk about the Jow, people focus on the concept of him being one eyed. Um, but I'd like to focus on what I believe is equally important, uh, which is that Iblis uh, has something written on his forehead. But before I do that, I want to mention that one of the coolest things about the Quran and one of the greatest things about being a human be being is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not simply leave us here with nothing. Uh, he gave you your human life, put you on the earth, and then he warned you and warned us exactly what was going to happen, warned us of our enemies and exactly what they were going to do. Uh, he, the devil, as it were, does not have the ability to uh, hide anything from us. In fact, he has to say everything plainly. So one thing he says that has piqued my interest for a long time is this. He says that after letting Allah know uh, the different ways he's going to come at mankind, min bayni yadayhim wa min khalfihim wa an aymanihim wa an He's going to come to them, you know, in front of them and behind them and, and above them and below them and to the right and left and all this stuff. He says something very interesting. He, he kind of threatens God, which is, you know, an egregious wrong on his part. But he says, that you're not going to find many of the human beings on earth that are going to be thankful. So right off the bat, we understand that one of Iblis's main goals is to make us ungrateful. Because ingratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very, very horrible sin. And I'm going to try and find uh, the best word the Quran uses to describe ingratitude. Now, since... Uh, the Quran uses language. Uh, one of the best tafsirs of Quran is with the Quran. Now, typically the word uh, used for uh, gratitude is shukr, but the opposite of it actually is kofr. Um, and I'm going to bring you lots of examples of that today. Uh, one example, and this is interesting how the Quran uh, quotes like really old nations that were well, well before the Prophet Islam's time and how they used the language. Uh, I think that, for example, sort of Yusuf is a great place to go to see how Semitic people used language before the times of the Arabs. Um, but one of the things he quotes is Fir'aun talking to uh, Musa. Is it, just as a side note, uh, Imam Isa, go for Kufr, the word kafir, kufr has two opposites in Quran, iman and shukr. So it's it's an interesting word because, you know, iman and shukr are, it's, it, you know, amanu thumma kafaru, thumma amanu thumma kafaru. And then other times, iman and shukr. Waman shakara shakara ali nafsi, waman kafara fa inna Allah ghaniyun hamid. Even when they're used together, they're used as opposites. Right. And, and uh, I would say we've, in, in Islamic eschatology, we focused mainly on the meaning of it, meaning the, uh, the opposite of iman. But today I'm going to focus on it being the opposite of, of shukr. So Fir'aun says to, to Musa, alayhi salam, that uh, didn't we raise you up uh, as a child and you remained among us for many years? And he says that, you know, you did this thing, you killed someone uh, in, in our city and then you ran away. And then he says, and then you were one of the ungrateful. So here's an example of the, or we could say an original meaning of the word kafir to Semitic people. Uh, and it's being used in the sense of the opposite of, of, of shukr. Well, okay, uh, who has kafir written on their forehead, Sheikh Omar? Well, typically, you know, obviously this is uh, <laughs> what you typically find on the internet when you type in Dajjal. And this would not be how students of Sheikh Imran Hussein would understand this. But uh, what I find fascinating is that the Prophet Sallallahu said that, you know, Dajjal would have kaf fa ra written on his forehead. And, and typically this is disbeliever, right? But I'm gonna say something I don't, I haven't heard anybody say before. I'm actually believe that it also means that Dajjal, when you, when you look at his modus operandi, it's not just to make people faithless, but to make them ungrateful. Hmm. And he's going to use something very interesting to make them ungrateful, and that's Dabatul Arb. Because Dabatul Arb, 
uh, as you're going to see uh, from different hadith from the Prophet Islam, is going to mark people as having faith or or ingratitude or disbelief. So the Jal has ingratitude written on his forehead. Is what I'm going to say today that maybe no one's heard for the uh, or they're hearing this for the first time. As a side point, I want to mention you kind of mentioned on your slide. If people are reading your slide, what's interesting is kafara is almost it's written disjointedly, right, in the literature. So it's kaf fa ra instead of the word kufr written together. So I just thought that should, that's interesting. That also lends more credence to what you're saying about its other side of the same meaning, meaning faithfulness uh, or faithlessness and, and kufr, meaning not having faith. But the other side of that is not having uh, shukr. Which is also interesting if you look at the word shirk and shukr. They're also interrelated. Uh, but I wanted to share with you something interesting just in a second. So shukr is sheen kaf ra. Shirk is sheen uh, ra kaf. Now another word in Quran that is extremely important that relates to what you're saying is the word fikr. Fikr and kufr also interrelate. So fikr is the ability to think and to ponder. So when you lose your when you lose your shukr, so to say, or you come into a state of kufr because you're not thankful, you lose your ability to think also. So the, I just wanted to maybe throw that in if you found it interesting, maybe you can comment on it too. No, 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 because uh, uh, one of the, the attacks of Dajjal on humanity is, is their ability to critically think. And that's why, of course, people are looking for this. And when they don't see this and it's something else, they're going to be deceived. And by the way, I want to just say this, if it hasn't already been said enough, if this is all we have to look for, this is not a fitna, Sheikh Omar. <laughs> not a fitna at all. It's, it cannot possibly be the greatest fitna that's ever befallen mankind. If all I need is a cyclops with Arabic letters on his forehead, uh, then everybody on earth would be able to see that. But that can't possibly be what this means, and Allah knows best. Uh, one of Sheikh Imran Hussein's uh, students, uh, female students, uh, actually said it to me in the best. She said, you know, uh, we have this phrase in English, the writing is on the wall right? The writing is on the wall. Is there any writing on the wall, Sheikh Omar? No, there's nothing on the wall written, but it's a phrase that means like something is obvious. It's out in the open. Everyone can see it, right? So, so God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't use metaphorical language like that. If kafara is written on his forehead, does it have to be literally on his forehead or can it just simply mean that it's obvious that this person is a disbeliever or obvious that they have ingratitude, you know? Okay. Now, I need to take uh, a segue here to let you know what is going to increase kofr in you. Because we cannot talk about Dajjal and Solomon without talking about time. Mm. This is an important piece of the puzzle. And I thank Sheikh Imran Hussein for pointing this out, uh, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about manipulating time leads to disbelief or in my case, of the art I'm arguing today, it will lead to ingratitude, massive amounts of ingratitude. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in Surah Tawbah, Ba'da'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, inna man nasi uziyadatun uh, fil kufr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that truly the postponement of the sacred months would be the interpretation of this is an increase in disbelief and ingratitude. So the, the Arab pagans, they used to take the sacred months that you weren't allowed to fight in and they would just rename them or delay them on purpose just so they could fight. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, very upset at this in the Quran. I always found it fascinating, the language he uses afterwards, that this is like, you know, totally horrible. And Allah doesn't guide people who have, uh, who are kafir at the end. <laughs> but once again, uh, I'm, I'm going to say that these things are actually talking about gratitude and ingratitude. Okay, so now that you have that piece of the puzzle, so we talked Just about... As a side notes. note, I want to mention 
because you mentioned this ayah, so I want to just mention today is uh, the 27th of Safar in the Islamic calendar. And if, I'll, if I remember, inshallah, I'll try to add that at the beginning of my talks from now on. Uh, Sheikh Omar, if you don't mind, if we pause the video, I have to pray Salat al Maghrib. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, is my screen still shared? Yes, Alhamdulillah. Okay, so um, the pieces of the puzzle so far. We know that one of the main attacks of Iblis is to make people ungrateful. And we know that kufr uh, in the Quran can also mean ingratitude. And we know that Dajjal is the greatest fitna to ever befall mankind. And we know that Dajjal has kafir or kufr written on his forehead. Okay, so one of his biggest attacks on mankind is not only going to be that he wants you to disbelieve in Allah, but he's going to do it through ingratitude would be my argument today. And at this point, I've argued now that manipulating time is an increase in ingratitude for people. And I'm going to bring oh, it to you. Interesting. That's all of technology in a sense, because you're trying to oh, manipulate so time. Oh, you're my presentation. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're connecting the dots because you're one of his students. So. so let's take a look at a really interesting story from the Quran about how technology leads to ingratitude. So let's look at the story of Seba. And by the way, today's presentation, you should really go read Surah to Seba. So there was the tribe of Seba, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There was a tribe of Seba and their dwelling places was a sign. Okay. Their dwelling, their dwelling place, a sign for all people. They had two gardens on the right and on the left. They were told, eat from the provisions of your Lord and be grateful to him. Take note of Allah's language here. A good land you have and a forgiving Lord. But they turned away refusing, so we sent upon them the flood of the dam. So the background story of this is that the people of Seba they built this massive dam. According to uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi, it was as big as the Hoover Dam or even larger. It was one of the largest dams of the pre-modern world. And the dam burst. So Allah says, and we placed in place of their gardens, uh, bitter fruit and sparse loat trees. So this is the part I want you to pay close attention to. So by that, we repaid them because of their dis because they disbelieved. Once again, the word there, kufr. And do we thus repay except the ungrateful? Now look at the language here in Arabic. Dadika jazaynahum bima kafaru wahal to jazi illa al kafur. Okay. So here we have an example of Allah using the word kafir, okay, to mean disbelieve, but relating it to ingratitude. And then Allah mentions, and we placed between them and the cities, which they had blessed many visible cities, and we determined between them the distances of journey, saying, travel between them by night for day in safety. So the area in which Seba was located, there were many different uh, towns and villages, all in a very reasonable distance from each other. So their life was easy, okay? They had technology, and their life was easy. But they insolently said, our Lord lengthened the distance between our journeys, and they wronged themselves. So we made them narrations and dispersed them in total dispersion. According to some uh, historians, 50,000 Arabs were scattered all over Arabia after this flood. Mm. Indeed, in that are signs for everyone who is patient and grateful. Okay, once again, take note of the language here. And then, of course, Allah mentions, and Iblis had already confirmed through them his assumption. What was his assumption, Sheikh Omar? That I'm going to make them ungrateful. Hmm. So they followed him except for a party of believers. And, had, and he had no authority over them except it was decreed that we might make evident who believes in the hereafter from those who are in doubt. And your Lord is over all things a guardian. Now, what I find fascinating is this really interesting dua that they allegedly make, um, which is, uh, I have a quote from, uh, let's see if I can find it from uh, Maldudi in here, where he mentions, 
um, the explanation of this. Uh, oh, you know, I didn't copy it. I'll have to just quote it from memory. So he mentions that he doesn't think, or one possible opinion is that they didn't actually say this dua. Because every time I read this dua in the Quran, Jacob Omar, I'm always like, why would you say something stupid like that? Hmm. Like, oh, Allah, make our journeys like difficult and long. But he says that they said it with their actions. In other words, by being ungrateful for the technology that they were given by Allah and the ease of life that they were given and the distances between the towns and cities, they basically showed ingratitude to that, okay? And then because of it, they were punished. So they actually said this dua by their actions. And if we ever get a chance one day in the future, Sheikh, to do a program on uh, the use of Semitic language, um, especially when related to the terms Christians use uh, in their Bibles and Jews use in their Bibles to describe God and Jesus and stuff like that. I'll actually talk about this uh, subject in more in depth about how the Quran quotes people sometimes, but he's actually, Allah is not actually quoting their words, but quoting their actions mm. in the form of words. Uh, it would be, a, and Allah knows best an argument I would make. So the summary of this story, what I'm trying to say by it is that in the very same story, that Allah is going to talk about how Solomon can manipulate time. He talks about the people of Seba and their ingratitude or their kufr in the blessings that they were given of technology. Okay. Now, yeah, so here's the quote. So yeah, this is where Maldudi uh, says, it. he says, uh, they may not have prayed this in words. As a matter of fact, whoever is ungrateful to Allah and his blessings tells Allah as if to say that he is not worthy of those blessings. Likewise, the nation which abuses those bounties of Allah, in fact, prays to him as if they say, our Lord, withdraw your blessings from us. We are not worthy of these. Yeah. Mm. It was the very next slide, but I didn't see it. Okay, now, let's get to Solomon, who is who the Antichrist wants to imitate. And let's look at what Solomon is able to do. I'm going to argue here that he can manipulate time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that for Solomon, the wind was made to blow. Okay. To Solomon, we subjected the wind. Its morning stride from sunrise till, till mid-noon was a month's journey. And its afternoon stride from the midday decline of the sun to the sunset was a month's journey. Hmm. So in one day, he could travel two months' journey. Hmm. And we caused fountains of molten brass or copper to flow for him. And there were gins that worked in front of him by the leave of his Lord and whoever of them turned aside from our command, we shall cause him to taste the torment of the blazing fire. So Solomon, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, he has the ability to have technology. Now his technology, of course, is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's able to travel great distances very quickly. And he's able to turn uh, Allah's earth into metal and use it. But more than that, he is able to control the jinn. Now, in the very same surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this fascinating story. I love this story because for the longest time, I didn't understand it or what to use it for. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the moment where Solomon commands his court to do something for him. After he's discovered the people of Seba and he's discovered Belkis and he wants their nation to submit to him. He says, O assembly of jinn, which of you can bring me her th throne uh, before they come to me in submission? So he's written Belkis a letter, you know, uh, basically saying, if you don't submit to the authority of my nation, then I'm just going to come and take you over. And she tries to bribe him and he's not interested. And so she just decides to come visit him. So he wants to surprise her by having the throne, her throne before she even arrives. So one of the most powerful of the jinn, an ifrit, he stands up and says, I'll bring it to you before you rise from your place. And indeed, I am uh, for this task strong and trustworthy. So take note here. Sheikh Imran Hussein has already explained this. That Dajjal, okay, wants to impersonate Solomon so that he can control the jinn. And one of the things the jinn can do, and they're showing you right here, is that they can manipulate time. Okay? 
they can manipulate time in the sense that they can bring things faster than natural means that we know beyond their help. Okay. And what is manipulating time except an increase in what? Kufr, in gratitude and disbelief. <coughs> so someone who had knowledge of the scripture or it was enlightened by scripture says, I'll bring it to you before your glance returns to you or in the blink of an eye. And Solomon placed it before him. And he says, this is, uh, I think he says, Hadam and Fadli Rabbi. This is from my, the, 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 the favors of my Lord. To test me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to use time and the manipulation of time to test people. And who's the greatest test of all? It's Dajjal. And what does Dajjal have written on his forehead? Kathara, in gratitude. Whether I'll be grateful or ungrateful. And whoever is grateful, his gratitude is only for the benefit of himself. And whoever is ungrateful, then indeed my Lord is free of need and generous. Notice the language in Arabic here again. If you don't know Arabic, you need to learn Arabic. If you're not reciting the Quran every month, you need to recite it every month. You're going to see these ayat that I'm quoting today. He says, Ashkuru am akfur. He's testing me, liyabluani, to see if I'm going to be thankful or akfur. I'm going to have ingratitude. And then he goes on and quotes this whole thing about shukr. Whoever has shukr, shukr is for himself. And women kafara, once again, the word kafara usually means disbeliever in the Quran, but in this case, it means in whoever's ungrateful, kafara, whoever, whoever's ungrateful, then his, his rub is free of him and, and generous. So technology, the ability to manipulate time is a test on human beings. And Dajjal is going to use that test because in Akhir as a man, a year goes by like a month and a month goes by like a week and a week goes by like a day and a day goes by like an hour and an hour goes by like the time it takes to kindle a fire. So Dajjal will attack time, but how's he going to attack time? How's he going to make mankind ungrateful, Sheikh Omar? And that's where we have to talk about Dabatul Arm. But we can't talk about Dabba to the autumn until we talk about something else. What is a Dabba anyway, Sheikh Omar? If I look up Dabba in, in you know, uh, Hans Weir's dictionary, Arabic dictionary, what is it going to tell me a Dabba is? I think it'll tell you that it's an animal or crawling creature, usually. What uh, it says is that it's some sort of riding animal, like a horse, a mule, a donkey, a camel. Okay, it's an animal that you ride on to get somewhere. Okay, now it can mean what you said. Maybe if you go to like Lisan al Arab or some of the other uh, more extensive, exhaustive dictionaries, you'll find that. Now, what is the Jow ride on, Sheikh Omar? A donkey. What is a donkey then? Is a donkey a daba? Yes. Absolutely, 100% it is. But I want you to take note of Dajjal's donkey. Is it any like a normal donkey? Let's read some of these narrations. Uh, it'll have, um, it says that uh, his donkey on which he will arrive will have a span of, of 40 hands between its two ears, right? The Prophet said, discussing Dajjal, that he will have a donkey and span between his two ears will be 40 cubits. This is a very big ears for a donkey to have. Yeah. Right? Another one says 70 cubits. Uh, its movement will be very fast. It will roam the sky. What donkey roams the sky, Sheikh Omar? Like a cloud driven by wind. How fast will it travel? Like clouds driven by wind. So this is some sort of conveyance that carries people and their belongings like a donkey would. And it has very, very large ears. And it can fly. And Dajjal will also hop between the heavens and the earth. Now, for those of us who are students of Sheikh Imran, we already know what this is talking about. This is talking about modern aircraft, which is technology. But where did this technology come from? Meaning what part of the world, at what time in history, and from what people who were contacting what being would be the questions I'd like to ask today. So if Dajjal is riding a donkey, then he's riding a dab. And that daba is technology. Hmm. 
So I want you to take a look at some of Antichrist's miracles, and I'm going to try and parallel them with things that we see today. So he'll travel the earth on a donkey. By the way, the, the Jews and Christians have this prophecy that he'll enter Jerusalem. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another narration says it'll be made of iron. Uh, it'll travel as fast as the clouds, and it'll hop between the sky and the earth. That's so right. I think that's a statement of Ali radiallahu one. Right. Uh, the Jal will step in the ocean, but it'll only wet his ankles, meaning he'll be able to go down into the depths of the ocean, but it won't be uh, difficult for him. Submarines. Uh, for those who obey him, he will cause it to rain, right? This is artificial rain, which if you don't know by now that most of the rain in America and Britain and France and Australia and Israel is not real rain, then you have a lot. And the Arab world, with they're trying homework. to create, you know. Yeah, and the Arab world is where. By the way, I've totally misspelled artificial here. <laughs> and the animals will grow fat. So wherever it rains for him, his artificial rain, it's not Allah's rain, it's artificial rain. Uh, the animals will be much bigger than normal, so growth hormones. Uh, he will cause the earth, to, the earth to bring forth its treasures, mining technology. He will kill a man and bring him back to life, modern-day life support technology. A voice will enter houses and take children prisoners. Uh, his voice actually will enter houses and take children prisoners. Uh, he comes with a mountain of bread and water, which is the modern uh, agricultural uh, industry. And, of course, one of the things that the Jow wants to do is he wants to give you a paradise right so look at the descriptions of paradise in the quran and compare it to modern western civilization right so paradise is always described as having rivers running underneath it that's what your modern plumbing technology is it's rivers of water running under your house that come into your bathroom which by the way did not exist back in the day so let's get to dab to arm we want to start with the Quran first, Sheikh Omar, when we talk about Dabit al Arab. We don't want to go to Hadith first. So here's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Dabit al Arab in the most clearest terms in the Quran. And he mentions it directly related to Solomon, and Solomon is directly related to the Antichrist. He says that whenever he decreed the death of Solomon, so Solomon is now sitting on his throne, he's controlling the jinn, he's controlling the animal kingdom, he's manipulating time, he's building great buildings, the jinn are diving into the earth to bring out its treasures for him, they're flying up into the sky to bring him all the things he needs, he's doing amazing things, okay, because the jinn are giving him the ability to manipulate time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that something is going to come along that's going to destroy the ability to manipulate time. And that's Dabatul Ard. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when his death was decreed for him, that this Dabatul Ard, this beast of the earth, it's going to eat at the Min Sa'ata. Okay? Now, when you look up the tafsir of this, it says that Min Sa'a is, is the same thing as Asa. So an asa is a staff. Moses had a staff. He used it to perform miracles. The, we already talked about this on a previous show with you about how uh, the magicians use their staffs today uh, in, uh, just as they did during the time of Moses to manipulate people and perform miracles. So this, this staff is able to do miraculous things. But mensa'a, according to a lot of the, uh, like, lisan al-Arab, it's a slightly bigger staff, and it postpones the ability of predators to attack sheep, okay? Meaning that because it's bigger, it can be a better defense against the likelihood that your animal will be eaten. So it's interpreted in the Quran, for example, in the ayah and Surah Tawbah, I quoted as postponing would be the word it would equivocate to in English. But just as Sheikh Imran mentions in his lectures on Dabat al Arab, this is not a very satisfying explanation. And the tafsir on this are even less satisfying that, you know, Solomon is sitting on his throne and uh, he dies and he's leaning on his staff. 
termite or worm comes along and slowly eats at it. And the gin continue to work for him until finally, you know, after days or weeks, months, or even years have passed, the staff breaks and he falls. Uh, there's so many things wrong with that story and illogical about it that, that it must be rejected by the intellect. So what Sheikh Imran interprets this, and I agree with him, is that the men sa'ata is the property of Solomon's miraculous staff that allows him to manipulate time, or in this case, control the jinn who give him the ability to manipulate time because they're able to, okay? So what is this dabat al The only other place in the Quran where Dabat al Arab is mentioned, and it's mentioned in a slightly different way, uh, I need to point out here that Dabat al Arab in even Hadith literature is sometimes just called Dab, even the uh, uh, al Arab part is, is left off sometimes. So it's in relation to a sign that will come at the end of time. Now, we already talked about how Dabat al Arab is one of the top 10 major signs of the Day of Judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that when the reality of the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes over mankind, he will bring out for them a daba, a beast, min al ard. Okay, from the earth to uh, to uh, it will it will communicate with mankind, or teklimuhum it'll harm them. Both recitations are correct, uh, according to the different riwayat of Quran. And then nas that mankind kanu bi ayatina la yuqinun. They were not certain of Allah's signs, His revelations. So when this beast comes, it's going to come at a particular time in history when humankind as a whole, is losing faith in religion, in the religious way of life, in belief in God and the afterlife. And it's going to communicate directly with human beings, and it's going to harm them in the process. The beast harms your faith. But how does he harm it? <coughs> because the beast is going to eat away at the miraculous ability of Solomon's staff to manipulate time. Now, as Sheikh Imran pointed out in his book, and you all need to read this, uh, Dajjal, uh, Dajjal, I think it's called Dajjal and the Jesed. Uh, I don't know the exact name of it, it's not coming to me at the moment. But he talks about uh, this particular uh, part of the Quran that the Antichrist, one of his abilities is that he has convinced the jinn somehow in the unseen world that Solomon is still alive. And Sheikh Imran brings up the example of, of um, one of the former prime ministers of France, Charles de Gaulle. He always says, you know, is Charles de Gaulle alive? And of course we all know he's, he's long passed away, but there's still film of Charles de Gaulle, right? And if I were to play those films for someone who, you know, grew up in a desert island, you know, we would say, oh, well, Charles de Gaulle is still alive, right? Because I can see him moving and going back and forth on a TV screen. Well, even in the unseen world, apparently Dajjal has this technology or this ability to convince the jinn that Solomon is still alive. And by doing so, they continue to work for him. However, since Solomon isn't alive anymore, who then is directing them? It's Dajjal. So Dajjal is manipulating the jinn and using them. And the jinn and whoever contacts them and tries to contact Dajjal, and if you don't know that people are trying to contact Dajjal, then you need to look up Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons is the smoking gun, people, that these scientists in modern Western civilization from the time of the quote-unquote enlightenment have been contacting through ritual magic demons and in particular trying to reach the Antichrist, who they knew about. And they wanted to get something from him. 
And Jack Parsons is a great example of someone who was contacting along with Aleister Crowley, uh, the Antichrist, and in fact, performed many rituals to try to get to him. And when the Antichrist finally communicated back to him, he indicated to Jack Parsons, who is a rocket engineer for, or was a rocket engineer for NASA, uh, that he was helping him with his mission. So these scientists are not just people who, who uh, you know, are godless atheists. In fact, they do believe in an unseen realm, and they've been contacting it for quite some time. And that's how they get their technology. Okay, now let's get to the beast in uh, Hadith literature. So Ibn Omar mentions that Dabat uh, this will happen when the, there remains no one in the world to do amr bil ma'ruf and nahi anil munkar. So I'm interpreting this to say that when the khalifa, the khilafa collapses, because that was the main institution on earth that was doing amr bil ma'ruf and nahi anil munkar. So right around the time that the khilafa collapses or begins to collapse, right? It doesn't have to completely collapse. That uh, it'll be contemporaneous of uh, this, this Dabat al will come along the same time that the sun begins to rise from the west. Uh, and will suddenly appear in open daylight, meaning it'll be able to be seen by everyone. And of course, I, I, no one has to, to agree with any of my ter interpretations today, but I agree with Sheikh Imran Hussein that the sun rising from the West is a false sunrise. It's actually modern Western civilization, which uh, is so attractive to the world. Um, it appears almost like a sunrise coming from the opposite direction and the entire Eastern world is attracted to it. And of course, modern Western civilization is directly connected with Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog is directly connected to, uh, of course, modern Western civilization is where the island of Britain or the island of Dajjal originates. So all of these things are intertwined to each other. But also what begins in modern Western civilization, Sheikh Omar, is the industrial revolution. And the Industrial Revolution is contemporaneous with Western Europe leaving religion. And the scientists who are working in the Enlightenment period, okay, are also involved in alchemy, they're involved in the occult, they're involved in contacting demons, and contacting jinn. And these jinn give them technology, and they're building something on the earth, from the earth. <coughs> Listen to this hadith. So this is mentioned from Abu Huraira. He says, the beast will come out of the earth. It will have the stick of Moses and the ring of Solomon. What does that mean? Literally, it'll have the stick? No, it means that it'll be able to perform miraculous feats, just like Moses' staff could perform miraculous feats. And it'll have the ring of Solomon, meaning it'll be able to control, right, the ability to manipulate time. And the beast will, will muzzle the non-Muslim and uh, with a stick and will adorn the believer's face with a ring so that people uh, will agree on the truth and the, the believers will be distinguished from the non-believers. Okay? Um, I'll get to what I think that means, by the way. The beast will be able to tell who is a believer from who is a non-believer? Sheikh Omar, you recall this because I think you mentioned this on your show a few years ago. What was a big controversy, uh, I think last year or the year before, was that these so-called Muslim prayer apps all of a sudden were exposed for sharing the data of who's using them with intelligence agencies all over the world. So this is a headline you should all look up on Google that Muslim Pro, which uh, most of us have used at some point to determine when the prayer times are when we're in a different city, uh, was actually selling that data. In other words, these intelligence agencies, okay, which are involved in the occult and directly related to modern Western civilization, and of course they are spies, and what does Dajjal have? He has a, he has a Jassasa with him, a spy. Um, they were actually sharing this data. Now, Sheikh Omar, who would use a Salah app except someone who has at least a minuscule amount of Iman in their heart. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have any Iman at all, of course you don't care when Fajr is or when Isha is, you're not looking to see uh, the prayer times in your particular area. But if you have even a little bit of faith, you're gonna wanna know, well, what time does Dhuhr come in today? Or what time does it leave? Hmm. You have some Iman. And now 
the world knows who most of those people are. Now, one of the last things I'm going to say before I tell you what I think and what you probably have already realized what I believe Davos ought to be is that this very interesting hadith. Now, Sheikh Imran Hussein absolutely rejects this hadith. It's nonsense. And that's fine. That's his opinion. And I respect him for it. But I, I'm going to interpret it today, which is that the, uh, the, this hadith mentions that the dabba will have a head like a bull. It'll have eyes and ears like a pig. It'll have uh, ears like the ears of an elephant. It'll have horns like the horns of a, a stag, or I, I believe a stag is a, a horse. Uh, it'll have the neck like the neck of an ostrich. It'll have the chest like the chest of a lion. Its color will be like the color of a tiger, so forth and so on. I believe that just like when the companions were first told about Dajjal's donkey, they, didn't, they weren't being told in a language that they wouldn't be able to remember. You know, the Prophet Islam is talking to, you know, uh, seventh century Arab Bedouins. He has to speak to them about things he's seeing that are going to happen in the future that they have no ability to reference. So he has to speak to them using their language, not introduce new words that they can't remember because they have to now narrate these things generation after generation until the signs actually appear. So the, the words the prophet uses are going to have to be words they know, but at the same time are accurate enough to describe what the prophet is, is being the visions or, or the, the revelation that he's receiving. So when we talk about Dajjal's donkey, what is a donkey in its essence? It's some sort of conveyance that carries people and their belongings long distances. Okay. But when we describe that donkey in Hadith, clearly it sounds nothing like an animal, but sounds more like what we can see today to be aircraft jets. I'm saying that in this Hadith, this is not meant to be taken literal at all. But what the Prophet Sallallahu is telling us in this hadith is he's telling us that the Dabatul Ard will have the collective abilities of the animal kingdom. In other words, birds fly and tigers run really fast and certain animals can dive deep into the ocean and certain animals tunnel into the ground and certain animals, they, they all have a unique technological ability. But this Dabbat al Ard will have every one of those things all um, in one amalgamation. Not that it will particularly look like these things, but it'll have their powers. Okay, so the conclusion is this, and this is what I'm my interpretation today. Anyone is free to disagree with that. Please do not agree with anything I've told you today until this makes sense to you. The Antichrist is using the jinn to help mankind build. That will give them all that they desire. They will become ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and thus the sinking of the earth will begin. Because remember, according to the story of Seba, when you're ungrateful, your technology ends up becoming a natural disaster for you. This will be caused by the empty cavities of the earth from the oil and gas deposits that have been drained until giant cavities are left open in the earth. To this is exactly what Dr. Ahmed Rahmatullah said in some of his, many of his lectures. Uh, well, that's, that's and, a very and even that army that's going to go to attack the Mahdi that will be sunk, one of the, he said that that will be most likely because we've just left a lot of empty spots. <laughs> yes. I mean, you're talking, I mean, imagine we've had hundreds of years of sucking giant lakes of oil and natural gas out of the ground all over the world. What, what have we put in place of it? Nothing. It's just an empty cavity now all over the planet and particularly uh, in countries that are rich with it. So Venezuela and America have tons of oil, uh, Russia and uh, Russia and it's particularly the Middle East have tons of oil. Well, this is the, the far east, the far west and the middle of the world, the very mm. three things the Prophet said, said would sink. Yeah. And by the way, what's going to cause them to sink, I believe, is possibly the Great War, that the, the seismic activity that's created by the nuclear explosions, and Allah knows best, is actually what's going to cause all this to crack. Uh, and the armies and the tanks all marching across this land, like when they try to invade Mecca and Medina to take it for their, their uh, false messiah. And the beast itself lives on the wealth of the earth. 
it, 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 it to appear to be alive, right? So what does Beni Israel worship after they come out of Egypt? They worship a jesed and khuar, mm. right? An empty vessel that appears to be alive because uh, Samiri, who's like an engineer, right? Dajjal uses the engineers to build these, this technology that appears to be alive, mm. okay? And then Gog and Magog, Western civilization, are not particularly intelligent. They've only eaten from the tree of the knowledge of evil. And by the way, I should do an episode with you on this where I talk about how uh, Allah warns people in the beginning of the book of Genesis in the Bible not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the knowledge of evil is a type of knowledge, right? When you torture dogs in, uh, in cages with uh, sand flies until they die, right? You might learn something that you otherwise wouldn't learn, but that's an evil way to learn something. But that's what gave the modern Western civilization its advancement over the Muslim world and the rest of mankind was that they started to eat from the tree of the knowledge of evil. They began to learn science without morals. So they were torturing and digging up dead bodies like Benjamin Franklin and so many other things to, to do things that are totally immoral. But because of that, their, their advancements in science went through the roof. But their worst immoral act was to contact the jinn. And then the jinn gave them the technology to manipulate time. And that is what you said at the beginning of my talk that you realize, Sheikh Omar, is that that is all technology, no matter what you say it is. Every single artificial thing that we've invented since the Industrial Revolution is a manipulation of time. I'll give you an example. Look at your stove. What is a stove? It, it's, it's, it's a machine that you go to and you press a button and immediately it heats up and you put your water on it. Your water boils within minutes, even seconds sometimes. And then after that, you can cook your food. But what, what would you have had to do before the invention of the stove, you had to go down and chop a tree down. You had to split it into logs. You had to bring it into your home, dry it, set it on fire. You had to mold a pot out of clay or metal. You had to go to a river and get your water. This took time, Sheikh Omar, a lot of your time. But the stove, it's instantaneous. You used to have to go to a library and read books and look up references. Now you just get on your smartphone, you get on your laptop, your time, you're speeding, you're bringing the future to yourself faster. But what does that do to us? And this is the most important thing I want to leave you today is it makes us incredibly ungrateful. Even though we have the ability to do things that no human in the history of the world 200 years ago could have even imagined we're, we're speeding into the future without even realizing it. Yeah, it's, it's so, so depressed. irresponsible at so many levels. Right. And we're so depressed. We're so unhappy. We're the worst disbelievers that have ever existed on the earth, the most irreligious people. Because Dabatul Arb, or as I would call it, the technology that we've gotten from the jinn that Dajjal is riding is leading us to an incredible amount of ingratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through that, we're becoming disbelievers and it's destroying us. But Dabat al Ard is a double edged sword, as Sheikh Imran Hussein points out. Because Dabat al Ard has to consume the resources of the earth to stay uh, appear alive. In other words, all your technology runs on this fossil fuel. The fossil fuel, by its nature, means it will run out. Mm. What will eventually cause the collapse that will expose the Antichrist for who he really is, which is he's not your rub. He does not, cannot perform miracles. He has no abilities. He's using the jinn and using Dabat al and using the technology to appear to you as God, but he's not. And he can't give you paradise because the moment this oil and this natural gas and all these things run out and there's great wars that happen to get the last drops of it, that's when he's going to disintegrate in front of us like salt and water. So that moment in time is when I believe Isa alayhi salam is going to come. It's when all of this technology is going to fail. And that's how Dabat al is going to consume the miraculous power of the staff. Because the staff that Dajjal is holding, he's not really Solomon. He doesn't really have the, Allah did not 
uh, give him the abilities that he gave to Solomon because Solomon made a dua that no one would have that. What Dajjal has is almost like a fake staff. It's an imitation. It's only fooling the jinn. So they continue to work for him. But once the technology collapses and the great wars begin, then it's goodbye, the fake imposter state of Israel, who, by the way, is one of the greatest technological centers of the world today. And as one yeah. of your guests from Pakistan pointed out, uh, who, when you talked about 9-11 truth, uh, he mentioned that one of the goals of the future is to turn Jerusalem into the tech capital of the world. Mm -hmm. So I know that I've said a lot of things today. And there's a lot of ayat that a lot of you need to go look up, a lot of things to think about. Uh, this is stuff that I've been thinking about for quite some time. Um, no, it's very logical. I think that there is, uh, it's all very logical. So it starts on the basis, uh, and it also makes me think because I am going to now go and read to Saba, specifically with the intent of seeing the word shukr and kufr in it. Uh, it and, and this idea of technology that you're mentioning, like I've never read Sutta Saba from that particular perspective. So that will be interesting, inshallah. But uh, kufr, ungratefulness. Uh, uh, the Jal has the stamp of kufr on his forehead. Uh, and uh, you quoted the, I think, central to this talk is the ayah you quoted about playing with time. Uh, fil kufr. It increases you in kufr. And this has, I mean, it's it's easily said that, you know, that technology is kufr, but I think it's it it has so much deep ramifications for, for the children that are always on the phone, you know, screen time. It's like you you quoted that narration that there will be a voice that will go into the people's houses and take the kids as hostages. Um, so you have, uh, let's go back to the main points, you know, ungratefulness, kufr, the jazz forehead, playing with time, playing with time equals technology, essentially. So what used to, uh, you know, take uh, maybe an hour to go on a horse. Now we'll take, what, 30 minutes? So uh, this is like, I don't, want, I don't want to go there the way Allah would want me to go there. I want to go there in a faster way than what Allah gave me. It's, it's embedded. It's embedded in, in it at the very intrinsic level that you're not accepting nature or you're not accepting things as Allah has made it. And you're trying to make things so that time will go faster because you're not happy with the way Allah has made time on earth. Bingo. <clears throat> By the way, I want to say something uh, because a lot of people may take that I'm anti-technology or I'm saying that technology is evil. Okay, part of that verse that I quoted from, from Suleiman is Suleiman says, Hada min fadli rabbi. That this is a favor of my Lord. Technology in itself is not evil because technology stamps you, believer and disbeliever. But how does one know that you're a believer using technology? Is you use it to remember Allah. Okay? You use it for khair. You use it to help people. You use it for, uh, for, for khidmah. You use it for, for service to people. I mean, you're, you're using it for, for khair, for good. But when you use technology, and it increases you in shukr, right? You're thankful for what you have. Then you're like Solomon. Solomon didn't reject the, mir the miraculous event because someone who had knowledge of the book was able to ma manipulate time also. But if it's increasing you in kufr and you're using technology for evil, right? You're not using your technology to watch Sheikh Omar's lectures or Sheikh Imran Hussein's lectures, but you're looking it to go to pornography websites, or you're using it to watch uh, inappropriate uh, nonsense and violence and all this other stuff, uh, or you're using it to slander and backbite people, or, or yeah, you know, etc. Then yes, it's 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 ziyadat tunfil kufr, right? It's it's increasing you in in disbelief. 
Uh, but it's dangerous. Dabat al ard is very dangerous. It will mark you believer and disbeliever, but it's it's a double-edged sword. I can't say Dabat al ard is totally evil, and I can't say it's it's totally good. It has seems to have both qualities. It has both qualities, but you need a high maqam like Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam to have uh, all these powers and still remain humble. Uh, so I think the lesson is that uh, we in the modern times, meaning for the Muslims that are listening to this, we in the modern times need to pay extra, 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 extra attention to shukr. Uh, it, we, we have to pay even, meaning shukr is always important, but I think it's even more important uh, it, and we need to be, what does that mean? That means that we have to realize that these technologies are not given to us by man, that they're given to us by the permission of Allah. Right, to test and us. To test us. The Abduani, Suleiman <laughs> says, to test me. So that mindset, which thank to you now, I will try to put into myself, that mindset that this technology because I've always had an internal aversion to technology, but after this talk, I'm going to place it not at the place of aversion, but at a place of danger, meaning uh, it's, a, it's a, it could be a good thing, but it's dangerous unless you have shukr. And you realize that this is a gift given to Allah, by, to you by Allah. And if you start thinking of this, this is man's or this is ours or we did this, then you've fallen for that very deception. Not only that, but be warned, it's going to all collapse. Because and it's it all going to absolutely it collapse. Could, at it, many, consumes, many it consumes the miraculous power of the staff. Don't forget that. <laughs> yeah. So don't become dependent on it. Learn to live without it because that is really tawakkul. You yeah. know, the people who depend on Allah, they depend on Allah, and the people who depend on other than Allah are going to have a rude awakening. Yeah, so, absolutely. It will collapse uh, for many reasons. Number one, because it's based upon riba. And Allah says, Yam riba. Allah will destroy the riba. And uh, it will collapse because, like you said, <laughs> that they're trying to, you know, they have themselves in, on an ICU unit keeping themselves alive, but they're eating out the resources of the earth. And it, 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 it is not sustainable. And I think they realize this, and now this is why they're trying to go to the great, the great reset, uh, trying to find a solution to this problem. But that solution is no good e e either. Uh, I mean, that's a longer conversation. But I think um, you have put the whole Islamic eschatology with this talk of yours, uh, alhamdulillah, in a very new and a very intellectually strong perspective, but you've tied it all together. It's a type of synthesis that you just did that is absolutely marvelous. And well, I, I, think I, I wanna say, uh, if, if, if anything good happened today, it's just simply from a law. It's, uh, it's just I, amazing. And uh, the manipulation of time in the modern, not just in terms of technology, but again, it's, uh, I don't know if you, one of the things that I've held as an opinion after it was brought to my attention by a brother is Samoa. Was it a land that was an island part of the East, Eastern world? And they shifted time, I think it was 2012, where Samoa would be part of the West. So they skipped a day. Yeah, I remember and, your episode on that. And so this now, now uh, the sun does rise from the West even from that perspective, that, that the, uh, the last Western timing falls on Samoa, which was the first of the East, meaning now what is the last of West is the first of East. And so that manipulation of time. Uh, and you know why they did it, interestingly enough? Commerce. Because Samoa would have uh, trade with Australia. Right, because they had different days and nights, so they said, "Well, why don't we just put it all in the same place?" 
same time zone. <clears throat> anyway, so that's, but this idea of increasing time, increasing speed, like the, the wind of Suleiman or uh, the, um, the moving of the jinns to uh, bring the, the throne of the queen uh, and our attitude towards those things. Uh, as mentioned in Sutta Saba, you also quoted verses from there about shukr and kufr and that being a test. Um, I think all of this is why, what another thing that you're, you're putting all the things together, what it does, uh, it brings us into that scenario now, like here and now. It's not something in the future. We are in it. We are in that scenario. We are in that vijalic system, so to say. Yeah, and, it's, and the beast it, is here. The beast, the beast is here. here. It's at the <laughs> it's at the minute level. For example, dabba. If you take it as transport, then the dabba is talking to you. The the, the GPS system is talking to you every day. Yes, yes, and harming and, you at the same time. And then dabba tul ard is like TAS, which is the transport. I forget what they're going to try to automate everything, right? And it'll be like one place that automates all transport, kind of like a robot driving everyone from one place to the next. Uh, and it'll be like an Uber, except it'll be by robots. And this is what they're thinking about the future. Well, what they want to, I mean, what the Antichrist wants to do is to build this giant machine on the earth. I mean, we've already built, I mean, if you think about your house, if you remove the, the walls and just see the internal contents, you're going to see these wires everywhere. You're going to see your Wi-Fi. It's like a giant living creature we've created on the earth. It's a dab to the arm. It, it, the electrical wires are like it's, uh, it's um, blood, blood uh, circulatory system. It's, uh, the Wi-Fi is like it's neural system uh, through which it feels yeah, exactly, exactly. and learns knowledge. Yeah. And then the servers, the servers that the internet are connected to are like the brain of it. And if uh, but, Baba is transport, transport is like the blood of any, like the trucks of America. Right. They're, like, they're, this, they're the blood. They're the ones that carry the nutrients, so to say, or the goods from one place to the other. And so you got this system uh, that is just like a living thing. And that it, reminds me a, of that narration. Jesset, by the way. <laughs> that it's a jessup, but it looks like a living thing. Looks and a so lot. that narration where all the different parts of different animals are mentioned uh uh it's like uh, you know it, it's creating it's taking these these you could say technologies like you said but it also reminds me that particular narration also reminded me of genetic manipulation where you have the head of a rooster and the legs of an elephant and it, that's what genetics technically can do Anyway, that's the side point. But. Well, anyway, I, 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 hope, I hope that at the very least, what I've tried my best to explain today with Allah's assistance, and anything good that you heard today is from Allah, anything wrong, reject it. Don't, don't listen to anything I have to say. It doesn't have to be right. This is only what I've come to understand from being Sheikh Imran's student for quite some time and, and being one of your students and listening to a lot of other uh, good people over the years. Uh, that this at least will pique the interest of people to want to read the Quran more to try to explain the world we live in. And, and also to go to the Quran first to understand a subject before you go to the Hadith. There's nothing wrong with Hadith people. I love them all. Even some of the <laughs> fabricated ones and the weak ones. I mean, it's all information for me, right? Uh, but I want the Quran to be the, the glasses through which I understand all of that other stuff. And by the way, the more of it I understand, the better. I mean, I could not have come to the conclusions I'm come to if I hadn't read the book 13th Tribe, hmm. or I hadn't uh, studied uh, Jack Parsons and, and Aleister Crowley, or I had, I mean, so every little bit of knowledge you can get outside of Islam also is helpful for you to, to put the pieces. Connect the dots. Right. Connect the dots. The, the more you expose yourself to knowledge, the more the Quran starts to open itself up to you. And the more you recite it every month from cover to cover in Arabic, right? You don't have to be an Arabic scholar. I'm not an Arabic scholar. I can't even, and this is uh, maybe uh, something quite surprising to a lot of you. I cannot have 
a, a deep advanced conversation with someone in Arabic. But I can open up the Quran and read it and read every word and I can use an Arabic lexicon and I can understand basic Arabic grammar and I can understand when I'm looking at a harf or a, a fa'il or an ism, you know, I understand this is mansub and this is jar and, you know, but, I, you know, you can do these things. It's not incredibly difficult. I mean, I can teach small children basic Arabic, hmm. but you can utilize this to help yourself connect to the Quran. And by the way, I'm someone who became Muslim when I was 25 years old. I'd never even heard Arabic. Hmm. So if I can come to these conclusions and they're beneficial to people, well, then you can do the same. So I hope this inspires anyone who listens Inshallah. to your talk today Inshallah. to have a deeper relationship with the Quran, to be thankful for that, and to have a better relationship with Allah, and to love the Prophet Muhammad for uh, more for all of the information he gave us. Okay, thank you so much. Jazakumullah khairan. Well, yeah. Subhanakallah, we'll be hamdika wa nashir wa laylaya anta wa nastaghfiru wa natubu alayhi.